Good morning, CMSD scholars and caregivers and everyone watching today. Happy Wednesday. It is July 29th, 2020, and we're going to celebrate the national parks. Good morning, CMSD scholars. Today is Wednesday, July 29th, 2020. We hope you're all safe and happy and healthy. We are celebrating all of our national parks today. So Mrs. Fisher and I are going to teach you a lesson about all the many national parks around our nation. And you might know people that are traveling out west right now. So enjoy. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to into republic on which stand one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hi CMSD scholars, it's Dr. Doe here with another book recommendation. This time we're going to talk about the book Making Bombs for Hitler by Marsha Skripik. This book takes place during the Holocaust, which many of you already know about. The Holocaust took place during World War II and Hitler was the leader of Germany. Hitler believed that people who were Jewish were less than human and he instructed his Nazis, which were kind of like his soldiers, to gather up anyone who was Jewish and take them to camps. And when we think about camps, we think fun, but these camps were not fun at all. When Jewish people arrived to the camps, they were ripped apart from their families, forced to sleep in really close quarters and uncomfortable beds, kept dirty, were starved, beaten, overworked, and often murdered. Six million Jewish people lost their lives during this time. Now, while this is a horrible topic, what I like to do is read about the heroes of the time, the people that stood up for the people who couldn't speak for themselves. In this case, people who are Jewish. And this topic also holds a special place in my heart. My grandmother, grew up in Germany during the Holocaust and my great-grandfather refused to follow Hitler and was put in prison because of it. And my grandmother was put on a work farm and to this day I have no idea what happened there. She doesn't want to talk about it. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the back of the book and hopefully it'll spark some interest. Lida thought she was safe. Her neighbors wearing the yellow star were all taken away. So during this time, if you were Jewish, you had to wear a yellow star on your clothing and that was to identify that you were Jewish. But Lida is not Jewish. She will be fine, won't she? But she cannot escape the horrors of World War II. Lida's parents are ripped away from her and she is separated from her beloved sister. The Nazis take Lida to a brutal work camp where she and other Ukrainian children are forced into back-breaking labor. When Lida is assigned to make bombs for the German army, she can't stand the idea of helping the enemy. Then she has an idea. What if she sabotages the bombs? When you sabotage something, you mess it up. So in this case, if the bombs were meant, you know, for the German army to use, if she sabotaged them, likely she sabotaged them so that they would be harmful to the Germans instead. Can she do so without getting caught? And if she is freed, will she ever find her sister? So this story is based on real historical accounts, but it's still considered historical fiction because the actual character is fiction. So there's a lot of truth in this book, but there's a lot of made up aspects of this book as well. So it's not necessarily a true story, but you would still learn from reading this book a lot about what happened during the Holocaust, especially to people who were not Jewish, who would not be willing to follow the Nazis in their quest to destroy people who are Jewish. So 
I hope you pick up this book and I look forward to hearing whether or not you liked it. So let's take a look at our standards for today. So we're gonna begin with citing several pieces of textual evidence to support the analysis of what the text says. Next, we're gonna be writing informative and explanatory text to examine a topic and to convey ideas. We're going to be looking at conducting a short research project and as always, we're going to be clarifying the meaning of unknown and multiple meaning words and phrases. There are oceans and rocks, places where fish swim and birds fly, where mountains spring up and trees and grass grow all around. History is made, art is created, things happen that should always be remembered. Heroes emerge. A woman sets people free. A man makes light. A leader steps forward. People get together. They help each other out. They make their own places to run and play and contemplate the universe. There's pride and gratitude and fun. It belongs to everyone. It can be a place, a feeling, a state of mind. So get up. Get out there and find your park. Wasn't that a great love letter? So to follow that, it's writing time. In the last clip, you saw a love letter written to the National Park in the United States. In this letter, the author described in detail the park's beautiful features and connections to his life. Think of a place you have visited or a place maybe you're from. Write a love letter to that place. Make sure, just like in the clip, you are using words to paint a picture in the mind of the reader. Describe how specific scenes from that place make you feel, how they have impacted your life, and why that place is so special in your heart. How many national parks does the United States have? So we're gonna take a guess on this one. A, 44. B, 27, C, 62, or D, 70. So I am literally going to use my background knowledge. A lot of people are um, discovering national parks this year because of all the social distancing. So I would say C, 62. Let's see if I'm right and let's see if you're right. Oh, I got it right. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so excited, but it's always fun to be, have the right answer. So with 62 national parks, we're going to take a look at the top 10 most visited in 2019. So coming in at number one was the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 12.5 million people visited there. Next is the Grand Canyon. They had 5.97 million then is the Rocky Mountain National Park, then Zion National Park. Number five is Yosemite. Number six is Yellowstone. They had four million visitors. Number seven is Acadia National Park. Eight is the Grand Tetons. Nine is the Olympic National Park. And 10 is Glacier National Park with three million. Okay, so those that are highlighted on the screen are the ones we're gonna be taking a look at today. And take a look. Do you recognize the person in the Picture? Well, if you go to Valley View, you do. It's Mrs. Aquino and her husband, and they visited the Grand Canyon not too long ago. Grand Canyon, it is known as one of the seven wonders of the world. So, in Northern Arizona lies one of the seven wonders of the world, the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is a massive canyon of red rock. At the bottom of the canyon runs the Colorado River. The Grand Canyon is over 277 miles long and over one mile deep. Guys, that's really deep. It's up to 18 miles wide and it's getting wider. The Grand Canyon was made by the Colorado River. The river has run through this area for almost 2 billion years, carving the rock into a canyon. Native Americans have lived around the canyon for thousands of years. Today, almost 5 million visitors come every year to marvel at the canyon. People like to go ha hiking and rafting. Hiking the canyon is thrilling, but it's dangerous. You can also camp in the Grand Canyon. People coming to the Grand Canyon should be careful though. 
Hiking here is hard and people often have to be rescued because they become too tired or dehydrated to continue. Over 600 people have died in the Grand Canyon in the last 150 years. So here's some fun facts. All right, the first one, the ancient Pueblo Indians first inhabited the Grand Canyon over 3,000 years ago. They used the caves for shelter and stored grain in rooms cut out of the rocks. Next, the Grand Canyon was a sacred site to the Pueblo people. They made pilgrimages to it. Next, the canyon is four miles across at the narrowest point. All right, so next, John Wesley Powell, for whom Lake Powell is named, was the first to lead an expedition to the Grand Canyon in 1869. He gave the canyon its name. And last but not least, the weather here is extreme. In the summer, the temperatures rise to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more, and winter temperatures can fall to zero degrees. So we're gonna do a Grand Canyon vocabulary match. So for each of the vocabulary words on the left-hand side, you're gonna match it to the definition on the right-hand side. So here we go. Number one is dehydrated. Two is ancient. Three is inhabit. Four is trench. Five is canyon. Six is sacred. And seven is pilgrimage. Now our definitions. A, a religious journey. B, holy. C, lack of water in the body. D, live in. E, narrow ditch. F, old. G, deep gorge, similar to a valley, but deeper. Okay, so take a second and see if you can say, all right, I would match dehydrated with this one. I would match ancient with this one. All right, here we go. Let's see if you got it right. So if you said dehydrated was lack of water in the body, you are correct. Ancient matches with old. Inhabit means live in. A trench is a narrow ditch. A canyon is a deep gorge, similar to a valley, but deeper. Something that's sacred is holy. And a pilgrimage is a religious journey. A giant chasm bigger than anything on the North American continent. A place so daunting in scale, no American had yet managed to journey into its depths. A place now known as the Grand Canyon. Today, visitors come to its rim to be thrilled and unnerved. But when early European travelers first stood here, they simply could not comprehend the canyon's enormous scale. While scientists still don't know exactly how the canyon was created, they do know that its story stretches back more than one and a half billion years thanks to colorful layers of rock that are now exposed in the canyon's walls. The oldest of these is a black rock known as Vishnu Schist. It was created from deposits of volcanic ash, mud, and sand that washed down from ancient mountains. In the hundreds of millions of years that followed, oceans, deserts, and swamps came and went across this part of Arizona, leaving behind more layers of sedimentary rock, so many that they created a giant plateau. Just 250 million years ago, the youngest layer in the canyon's walls was laid down. It's a light-colored stone known as Kaibab limestone. It was only after these deep and colorful rock layers were formed that the Colorado River started carving a giant canyon through the plateau's floor. Feeding it with thousands of tributaries that eroded the landscape even more and helped expose the colorful layers below to create this giant chasm, which reaches in places 18 miles from rim to rim. It's a process of erosion that continues, a process that's created some of the canyon's greatest landmarks. From towering rock pinnacles near Temple Butte to deep geological scars known as the Hindu Amphitheater, and soaring above, the Tower of Ra. Okay, so to 
To get ready for today's lesson, Mrs. Fisher and I asked a lot of family and friends to highlight some of the national parks. And one of the top national parks that people recommended is Yellowstone National Park. So Yellowstone National Park is nearly 3,500 square miles. So you have to try to visualize that. Um, Google, what, what does 3,500 square miles look like? So it's wilderness recreation area atop a volcanic hotspot. Mostly in Wyoming, the park spreads into parts of Montana and Idaho too. Yellowstone features dramatic canyons, alpine rivers, lush forests, hot springs, and gushing geysers, including its most famous Old Faithful. It's also home to hundreds of animal species, including bears, wolves, bison, elk, and antelope. So if you, if you look at this slide and you pay attention to um, not only all the features, but when we look at writing, we also wanna use a lot of adjectives to describe our nouns. So look at how the author used dramatic canyons, alpine rivers, lush forests, hot springs, gushing geysers. So remember that's always important when you're using expository writing or descriptive writing. All right, so let's look at our next one. Hey, guess what? If you're a sixth grader, you get to read the novel Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech. This novel ties so perfectly with our National Parks segment here today because in it, the main character does some traveling and she travels to some of the parks that we're talking about today. So we don't want to give away too much, but we're going to show you the trailer so you can be excited for reading this novel this year. Yellowstone National Park is home to so many very unique animals. So it is home to the largest concentration of mammals in the lower 48 states. In addition to having a diversity of small animals, Yellowstone is notable for its predator-prey complex of large mammals, including eight unique species. I so didn't say that right. <laughs> bighorn sheep, bison, elk, moose, mountain goats, mule deer, pronghorn, and white-tailed deer, and seven large predators, black bears, Canada lynx, coyotes, grizzly bears, mountain lions, wolverines, and wolves. Whew, that's a lot of animals.
In the quest for amazing creatures, we can't help but end up in northwestern Wyoming, where there's one monster of a national park, Yellowstone. Covering 3,400 square miles, the place is so huge, it would take an hour to drive from border to border at highway speeds in any direction. Almost the whole park sits inside the caldera of an active supervolcano. If it ever blows its top, it would mean an end to life as we know it. It would throw a massive rock the size of Mount Everest into the air, and the ash cloud would create a global nuclear winter. Ironically, it's this same hot spot of geothermal energy that's been cooking up life forms for 18 million years. You half expect to find an ark lying around. No matter what species, phylum, or family you like, you'll probably find it in Yellowstone National Park. It's one of the best places on Earth for wildlife watching. With 30,000 visitors to Yellowstone each day, you wonder if there's enough room left for the animals. No problem. There are animal sightings here that can stop traffic. Visitors aren't the only ones stampeding through the park. Yellowstone is a cradle-to-grave sanctuary for about 5,000 bison, the largest herd in the U.S. They recall iconic images of America in the days of the untamed West. You can spot the kids at their first swimming lesson or watch the teenagers getting tough. There are scenes in Yellowstone you'd have to go back in time to see anywhere else. An absolute must do for the creature curious is the amazing Lamar Valley, nicknamed America's Serengeti. The pronghorn sheep graze, frolic, and mix it up a little when their mother's not looking. Meanwhile, wolves use stealth as much as speed to snag their daily meal. Mountain lions are a less common sight, which is probably a good thing, unless you're in your car. Trek through any of the 1,000 miles of backcountry trails, and you'll see an entire food chain that doesn't include you. Unless you mess with the mountain lions. Summer or winter, the critters are on display. If you're looking for big bear hugs and you're smarter than the average tourist, it's a cinch to find a family of the most popular animal in the park. Black bear cubs are born naked, blind, and only eight inches long. But they'll grow to nearly 400 pounds, so don't get too close because these guys can follow you pretty much anywhere. Male grizzlies get even bigger. They love their alone time. And at 700 pounds, they get plenty of it. You'll want to keep your distance from these moody Bruins. They're extremely dangerous, but they're also an endangered species. Less than 1,200 live in the continental US, and half of them are in Yellowstone. Harder to see but easier to catch are Yellowstone's 16 species of fish, including six kinds of trout. 5% of Yellowstone's area is water. There are 220 lakes and enough miles of rivers, streams, creeks, brooks, and waterways to stretch from New York to LA. The Yellowstone River is the longest undammed river in America. Of course, it's all catch and release out here. So bring your lunch and leave some fish for the next guy. So next up, we're gonna do some writing using descriptive details and vivid verbs. So we're gonna use illustration of various animals from Yellowstone to write a sentence and describe the scene using sensory details and verbs that pop off the page. So let's take a look at the picture. So analyze the picture for just a second. Then I want you to notice the words in red. So here we go. The softly blowing golden grass surrounded the single massive bison as the nearby river sang a song of peace and tranquility. So not only did we use descriptive details and vivid verbs in there, but we also popped in some personification with the river singing. Let's do another one before you are on your own. So 
let's take a look at what not to do, okay? Analyzing the picture, now look at the sentence on the left. Three bears walked in the grass. Okay, that is a very, very simple sentence, not for middle school at all. Now, if we could add some details and vivid verbs, the immense mother bear and her two energetic cubs slowly meandered through the tall spring grass in search of fresh salmon to fill their grumbling bellies. Okay, one picture, but yet look at the difference in the two sentences. So now it's your turn. Look really carefully at that picture. Look at the time of the day, the time of the year, the colors, how the wolf is standing, the background. Use your inferencing skills and create a sentence just like the ones on the previous slides. If you're sitting with a family member, why don't you say your sentence out loud? Okay, here's a couple more. What we'd like you to do now is Look at each one of these pictures. Choose one and then write a sentence similar to the ones that you saw as the examples. Okay, so the top picture, you've got three bears. Maybe that's the mother swimming. I don't know, you can decide. Tiny little chipmunk. And then you've got a beaver getting ready to go swim in the water. So there's lots of opportunities for some really cool details there. Hello CMSD scholars. My name is Cameron Rehor. Mrs. Gus asked me to highlight one of our parks. Every year my family goes to Lake Hope, which is in the middle of Zalaski State Forest. Lake Hope is about four hours south of Cleveland and Vinton County. My favorite things to do are fishing, swimming, boating, and paddle boarding. One thing we do every time we visit is go to the fire tower. We climb to the top and it is about 70 feet tall. We also visit Moonville Tunnel. It is rumored to be haunted and is very scary to visit at dark. I like camping in the middle of the forest and hearing nature all around me. Thank you, goodbye. the difference between conservation versus preservation at the National Park Service. What's the difference between the two and how does the National Park Service play a role in each of them? So conservation and preservation are closely linked and may indeed seem to mean the same thing. Both terms involve a degree of protection, but how that protection is carried out is the key difference. Conservation is generally, generally associated with the protection of natural resources, while preservation is associated with the protection of buildings, objects, and landscapes. Put simply, conservation seeks the proper use of nature, while preservation seeks protection of nature from use. So, let's see if you can put together whether these are an example of conservation or preservation. Yellowstone National Park, that in itself, which one would you say? Mining regulations. What about no-fly zones? Okay, places where airplanes are restricted from flying. The Endangered Species Act. What about captive breeding programs? And last, Big Cypress National Preserve. Okay, we're gonna let you think on this and we're gonna give you the answers next week. It is journal time. So conservation and preservation both have admirable aims. Conservation takes a more flexible outlook when it comes to human interaction with resources. While preservation is a very strict mindset 
determined to keep human impacts to an absolute minimum. So in your opinion, which philosophy is best? Why? Make sure you support your opinion below with at least one well-constructed paragraph. So on a separate piece of paper, see if you can decide which one do you feel is the best philosophy. America's national parks, they connect us with nature, with our history and culture, and with each other. More than 400 of our most treasured places with clean air and dark skies, teeming wildlife, and clear waters. Places that should remain protected for all of us forever. But the truth is, it's not that simple. For as long as there have been parks, there have been threats to everything that makes them so special. But there have also been people just like you, standing up, speaking out, ready to protect the places that move us. And that's just what we've done. Working together, we've stopped a large-scale development at the gateway to the Grand Canyon, a casino within cannon range of the hallowed ground of Gettysburg, and America's largest landfill on the doorstep of Joshua Tree. Victories for now, but not forever. Sometimes these fights come back again and again, but we'll be there because for nearly a century, we've been fighting back so future generations can enjoy our national parks just as we have. The pressures facing our parks are great, but the passion of their protectors is greater. This is our land, our history, our voices, and we're making a difference together. take a look at some conservation triumphs from the past 100 years. So the Joshua National Park in California. In 2011, decision by the Supreme Court ended a decades-long battle to stop what had been the nation's largest landfill at Eagle Mountain on a site surrounded on three sides by the National Park. So that means that a huge landfill, a huge garbage dump was not allowed to be put next to the Joshua Tree National Park. Hooray! <laughs> okay, so the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in North Carolina and Tennessee. In 2011, MPCA marked a significant victory for regional air quality by brokering a historic agreement with the country's largest power utility to retrofit or retire 54 of its 59 coal-fired boilers. So this improved air quality in both of those states in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And Yellowstone. So shortly after its founding in 1919, NPCA began a century of advocacy in the world's first national park by protecting Yellowstone's elk population and defeating a proposal to dam the Yellowstone River. So that in itself was huge, all right? It protected the elk population and it also protected the Yellowstone River. Now let's take a look at the need to preserve. And we're gonna look at Glacier National Park in Montana. All the glaciers are shrinking in the 1800s. There were estimated to be about 150 glaciers here. However, today we only have 25 glaciers. The glaciers are measured by a number of different ways. Uh, one of the most obvious ones is using repeat photography, where we go and occupy a site from which a photographer took a picture in, say, 1910, and then we re-photograph that from exactly the same spot. Once you go every uh, several years to five years or 10 years, that's when you see the really big changes. When we first started this project, we thought every other year was, was gonna be too much. But recently we've seen so much glacier change that now we are increasing our frequency of repeating photographs or visiting glaciers. You can see that it's all melted away. The lake has gotten bigger. All this ice has uh, contributed to the, to the water and is retreated back up towards the headwall of the mountain. 
We also do things that are a little bit more modern, such as taking precision global positioning systems and uh, going along the margins of the ice so that we can look at changes in the area of the ice through time. Glacier National Park is an excellent natural laboratory to examine the effects of climate change. This area is actually warming at two to three times the rate of the global average rise in air temperatures. So these increased air temperatures are decreasing the snowpack in the glaciers in the high country and increasing disturbance events like wildfires that we're experiencing. Some of the species that we're studying, these aquatic insects, might be the first species actually to go extinct due to the effects of global climate change. We've already seen a, a contraction in the distribution of some of these species in comparison to collections that were done back in the 1960s. Even though glaciers may seem disconnected and far away to people, they actually affect a lot of things downstream. And that's even evident in other things such as the way that the snowpack affects the huckleberry crop. And this is of course a vital food source for grizzly bears. Animals that live in these upper elevations are adapted to the colder temperatures there. And because we're predicting warmer temperatures, they may be particularly vulnerable to these changes. Um, they also have very specific food needs and the food changes for them could also influence their ability to thrive. In spite of the fact that it'll be different in the future, it's still going to be a valuable asset to Americans, both as a, as a research outdoor laboratory and, and maybe as a, a kind of iconic lesson as to what climate change can do to natural landscapes. So this is a two-part project because projects rock. So what we'd like you to do for this week is research a nearby example of conservation or preservation. See if you can find something within Ohio, within your community, somewhere close by, an example of conservation or preservation and have it ready for next week. All right, we hope you enjoyed today's show and lesson. We will see you next Wednesday. So we are going to end the lesson with a teacher from Max Hayes, Robin Elliott. She is awesome. She is dedicated and she was more than willing to share a video with us about her trip to some of our national parks. So we hope you have a good day.
Hi, my name is Teresa Bender. I teach at Paul L. Dunbar Arts Enrichment Academy, and I'm here to teach you how to solve two-step equations using the flowchart method. The standard we're going to be reviewing today is 7EE3. I can solve multi-step equations. Let's begin to look at this equation. First thing you need to look at is how many operations do we have in the equation? We are first dividing by six and then we are adding four. So that is two operations. So we're going to need to have two arrows on the top row and we're gonna need two arrows on the bottom row. So we need a total of six bubbles in our equation. The first thing we're gonna look at is our variable. What are we what is our variable? Our variable is x. What are we doing with that x? We are dividing by six. So then we show that x is divided by six. We're moving over, then we're going to be adding four. So we have x divided by six plus four in bubble three. Bubble four is the answer to our equation, which is seven. So remember from one-step equations, Whatever's in the top row, you do the inverse on the bottom row. So in the top, we added four. So the inverse of adding four is to subtract four. So what is seven minus four is three. And then the inverse of divide by six is to multiply by six. So we have three times six is 18. And now we can check our work. We have X is equal to 18. So how do you check your answer to make sure you have the correct answer? You have to substitute back into the equation. So we have 18 divided by 6 plus 4 equals 7. Well, 18 divided by 6 is 3. 3 plus 4 equals 7. And then we have 7 equals 7. So we know that our answer is now correct. Let's take a look at the number of operations we see in this problem here. We first see y is being divided by 8, and then we see that we're going to be adding 5. So that is two operations. So we're going to need to have two arrows on the top row, and we're going to need two arrows on the bottom row. We always start with our first bubble is always our variable. What is our variable in the problem? It is y. What are we doing with y? We are dividing by 8. So now we have y divided by eight for bubble two. Then we are adding five. So now in bubble three, we have y divided by eight plus five. And in bubble four is always the answer that is 13. So what is the inverse of adding five? Subtracting five. So now we have 13 minus 5 is 8. And what is the inverse of dividing by 8? It is to multiply by 8. So we have 8 times 8, which is equal to 64. So y is equal to 64. Remember, you can always check your work by substituting the value you had for y into the original equation. So we have 64 divided by 8 plus 5 equals 13. Well, 64 divided by 8 is 8. 8 plus 5 is 13. So 13 equals 13. So we now know that our solution is correct.
Okay, let's take a look at the situation here. Ask yourself, how many different operations do you see going on in this equation? I see multiplication with the 4 and the K, and I see subtraction. So we always start with our first bubble being the variable. What is our variable in this situation? It is K. What are we doing with K right away? We're multiplying by 4. So in bubble 2, you would have 4K. Then the next operation we have is subtract 7. So in our third bubble, you would have 4K minus 7. Remember, the answer always goes into our fourth bubble here, and our answer here is 17. And to go from the top row to the bottom row, you always do the inverse operation. So what's the inverse of minus 7? It is to add 7. So what is 7 plus 17? 24. Then what is the inverse of multiply by 4? It is to divide by 4. So what is 24 divided by 4 is equal to 6. So k is equal to 6. But remember, we're not done here. You always have to check your work by substituting the value of k back into the equation. So we have 4 times 6 minus 7 equals 17. Well, 4 times 6 is 24. 24 minus 7 equals 17. Does 17 equal 17? The answer is correct. So our solution is perfect. Let's take a look at this next equation. How many different operations do you see? Well, I see two. I see B being divided by three, and then I see the next operation of adding nine. So we're gonna need to have two bars on the top and two bars on the bottom for the two different operations that we are going to be performing here. Remember, the first bubble is always our variable. What is our variable in the situation? It is B. What are we doing with the B right now? What operation? We are dividing by 3. So in the second bubble, we will show B divided by 3. What is the next operation we have is to add 9. So in our third bubble, we would have B divided by 3 plus 9. Our fourth bubble is the answer to our solution, which is 21. Remember, to go from the top row to the bottom row, you always do the inverse of, a, of the operation. So what is the inverse of addition? It is subtraction. So what is 21 minus 9? Correct, 12. What is the opposite or the inverse of divide by 3? It is to multiply by 3. So what is... 12 times 3 is 36. So B is equal to 36. But remember, we want to get an A on this, this exam, so you want to make sure that you substitute back in for the value of B. So the value of B we got was 36 divided by 3 plus 9 equals 21. Well, 36 divided by 3 is 12. 12 plus 9 equals 21. Well, 12 plus 9 is 21. Does 21 equal 21? It does. So we know our solution is correct. Okay, now we're getting into a little bit more complicated problems, and I know you're up for it and you're ready to be successful. Remember, the first step in looking at these equations is always to ask yourself, how many different operations do I see going on in this equation? If you said three, you are correct. I first see seven being multiplied by x, then I see dividing by nine, and I see subtracting 11. So we, because there are three different operations, we're gonna need three different bars on the top and three bars on the bottom. Remember our first bubble, we're always going to start with a variable in the problem. So our variable here is x. What operation are we performing on the x? We are multiplying by 7. So bubble 2 will have 7 times x. The next operation that we see going on is dividing by 9. So our third bubble will be 7x divided by 9. 
the last operation that we have in this problem is to subtract 11. So in our fourth bubble, we would have 7x divided by 9 minus 11. So on the bottom, on the right-hand side, our next bubble, number 5, would be the answer, which is 87. Remember, from, to go from the top row to the bottom row, we always do the inverse operation, or what we can say, the opposite. So what is the opposite of minus 11? You're correct, add 11. So what is 87 plus 11? 98. Now, what is the inverse of divide by 9? Multiply by 9. So 89 times 9 is equal to 882. What is the inverse of multiply by 7? Divide by 7. So what is 882 divided by 7 is equal to 126. So x is equal to 126. But remember, we can't just stop there. We want to make sure that we have the right answer. So we can always check our answer by substituting the value that we, re we got for x into the equation. So what is 7 times 126 divided by 9 minus 11 is equal to 87? Well, 7 times 126 is 882 divided by 9 minus 11 equals 87. I'm running out of space, so I'm going to move up over here. 882 divided by 9 is 98 minus 11 equals 87 and 98 minus 11 is 87. 87 is equal to 87 so we got the correct solution. You see you know what you're doing with this problem. I, I know you can do this. Okay, I'm so proud of you. Let's keep going. I know this is getting a little tiring, but I know you got it in you. The more you practice, the better you are at this. So how many different operations do you see in this problem? You are correct. You see three. We are first multiplying by three. Then we are dividing by seven. And then we are subtracting by eight. So if we have three operations. You need three bars. You need three on the top and three on the bottom. What is our variable in this case? It is y. So in our first bubble, we're going to put y. What is the first operation? Are we performing on y? We are multiplying by three. So three times y is three y for bubble two. The second operation we are do doing is dividing by seven. So we have three y divided by seven in bubble number three. Our last operation is to subtract 8. So now in bubble 4, we have 3y divided by 7 minus 8. In the fifth bubble, we're going to put the answer to the equation, which is 7. Now let's talk, let's talk through this. Remember, whatever is on the top, you're going to do the opposite for the bottom. So what is the inverse of minus 8? You are correct. Add 8. So 8 plus 7 is 15. Now, what is the inverse of divide by 7? You are correct. It is to divide, or multiply by 7. So what is 7 times 15? Correct. It is 105. Now, we're almost there. So what is the inverse of multiply by 3 would be to divide by 3. So what is 105 divided by 3? That is 35. So here we just solved that y is equal to 35. But to guarantee that that's the right answer, we're going to check our work. Remember, to check your work, you need to substitute in for the value, that you, the value for y. So we have 3 times... 35 divided by 7 minus 8 equals 7. 3 times 35 is 105. So we have 105 divided by 7 minus 8 equals 7. Well, what's 105 divided by 7? That is 15. So we have 15 minus 8 
equals 7. 15 minus 8 is 7, so we have 7 equals 7, so we now know that that is the correct solution. Yay, you made it. Now let's take a break and let's think about at the end of this lesson, are you able to solve multi-step problems using flowcharts? If you can, you got the lesson. If not, I highly recommend going back and reviewing the lesson again. Have a wonderful day and thank you for your time. This is the MSD. I am. I am. I am. Joseph. I am. Cleveland Public Schools. In the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, we believe that teaching and learning should be hands-on, engaging and fun, real world, personal and culturally relevant, challenging. We believe teaching and learning happens when we work together with our classmates, when we talk to each other. We believe schools function best when they have the support from district central office. A central office that provides specific supports to each school and recognizes that one size does not fit all. A central office that bases support on best practices and our feedback. A central office that utilizes the strengths of teachers and leaders across the district. At the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, we believe all children can learn and achieve at high levels. Our graduates must possess skills like creativity and innovation critical thinking and problem solving. Global citizenship. Communication. In the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, we believe that all students must graduate career and college ready with the skills necessary to fulfill their dreams.